it's all over. The GPU shortage, I mean. Well, not for everyone, sure. Technically, there still aren't any cheap new graphics cards worth buying, but the used market is stabilising, and you can once more pick up DX12-capable GPUs for less than $100. After over a year of the scalper pandemic, nature is finally healing. So, what I'm saying is, you really don't need to put yourself through this. I, I don't need to put myself through this. I have plenty of other things I could review instead. <sighs> Fine. I guess I'll do it. The Intel UHD 730 graphics should actually inspire a little more enthusiasm in me than the last time I looked at a Team Blue iGPU. This is, after all, the new improved Intel, who have started to push back against the red threat of AMD's Vega iGPUs. There was a lot of marketing hype that their 11th gen CPUs would have new Iris XE graphics that could compete with entry-level discrete GPUs from Nvidia and... Hmm? What's that? That's... that's not this CPU. The laptops. So, what's this? Iterative refresh. Huh. Well, shit, sorry about that. Okay, so the UHD 730 isn't much to shout about, but if you picked up an i5-11400 like I'm using today, or an i3-12100 or similar chip on the 12th gen lineup, you might want to know if this can tide you by until you can get something more capable. To that end, I'll be running through a couple of titles from my 2022 test suite, but mainly I'll be looking at games that are a little more realistic for this tier of GPU. I didn't want to start out on a negative, I honestly thought Fortnite these days would be an easy win for the UHD 730. The standard DX12 renderer with competitive settings was a bit much to ask at 1080, barely managing 30 FPS and dipping dangerously close to single digits on the low end. Of course, this is the very scenario that Epic made performance mode for, and normally it would be a no-brainer, except... <sighs> well, it kinda sucked. At the same settings, everything on minimum except view distance, averages only went up to 44 and 1% lows were still terrible. Simply aiming down sights or looking in the wrong direction saw FPS drop into the 20s. Dropping the render resolution to 67%, approximately 1280x720, wasn't the slam dunk I'd hoped for either, still failing to average 60 FPS and experiencing the same frame drops as in full 1080. The last time I tested Valorant on Intel Integrated Graphics, it was using the HD630, two generations prior to this one. On a laptop CPU, the best result I saw was about 98 FPS at 1080 low. Whether it's because of the higher power levels, better RAM, or just pure GPU architectural improvements, this time around saw a very impressive 155 FPS on average, with lows over 100. If you have an HDMI 2 or DisplayPort connector on your motherboard, you could even drive a high refresh monitor here. Unlike Valorant, Splitgate puts less demand on the CPU and more on the GPU. I had to drop settings insanely low, with 50% resolution scaling, in order to get the playable experience here. I say playable, but although bright orange enemies should be pretty easy to spot, it is still hard to be precise at what is effectively 960x540. This is made worse by the fact that the playable frame rate isn't particularly stable. The average is a very palatable 74, but the 1% lows are only in the low 40s. In a couple of my previous low-spec GPU reviews, I've suggested Hades as a game that can run on a potato, but that gets a lot of good reviews. Recently though, I've actually got round to playing it and... <sighs> guys, I think I'm addicted. I've not been able to play anything else in weeks. I'll tell myself I can have a quick playthrough and it ends up stretching out to 3am. The best thing about this title for the purposes of this video is it runs, and runs pretty well, thank you. I tested at 1080 and saw a smooth 60fps most of the time, with very occasional drops into the 40s. It can be pretty twitchy, especially when things go a bit bullet tartarous, but unfortunately there's nothing in the way of render scaling or quality settings to adjust. If you want a guaranteed 60, you should probably think about dropping resolution a notch or two. 
Apex Legends might have recently launched on mobile, but it doesn't look like any of that super optimization has made its way to the PC version as yet. Lowest settings and dynamic resolution targeting 60 FPS results in an erratic frame rate and an image that looks like absolute trash. The average hits 35 with 1% lows of about 20. It's possible that average might look a little better if you get to play for longer than I did, but on both my run-throughs my teams got wiped in a couple of minutes, so I can't really confirm or deny. I don't know if anyone still plays Valheim, but it's a small download and I've tested it on a couple of low-spec GPUs in the last year and a half, so I thought I'd see how it's holding up. At lowest settings and 720 resolution it's actually pretty playable. I saw an average of 35 FPS and lows into the mid 20s which in this style of game is pretty acceptable in my opinion. Alright, so I didn't genuinely expect God of War to do well on the UHD 730, but it recently received FSR 2 and I was curious to see how good or otherwise performance would be. With the normal render scaling slider set to its minimum of 50%, 1080 came back with a 19 FPS average and 12 FPS 1% low. Dropping the output resolution to 720 helped somewhat in the way of performance, but necessitates changing the desktop resolution to 720, unless you're happy to run in a window. FSR 2 is known to be more demanding than the basic scaling options, so it's not really surprising that 1080 with performance FSR only manages 16 FPS on average, and ultra performance again climbs by a barely perceptible 3 FPS. Although I'm not really advocating trying to play at either setting, I would argue that the basic scaling image looks less grainy than the FSR one, and is definitely the option I'd choose. Cyberpunk 2077 only just got FSR 1.0 in February, and owners of low-end discrete graphics cards are probably holding out for an FSR 2 update, but in the meantime there's much less of a performance difference between FSR 1 and the game's built-in render scaling. FSR performance runs at 23 FPS using low quality and medium textures. Using conventional resolution scaling instead gives an extra 3 FPS or so, which in this context doesn't seem like a big deal. I'd also argue that FSR doesn't look much different to the game's own scaling, and in a blind comparison between the two, I'd probably only get the right answer by accident. I was a tiny bit disappointed in GTA V, but I guess I shouldn't be really. Last year I tested the previous generation UHD 630 and saw a 26 FPS average at 1080 normal, and it crashed a bunch of times in the process. Not only did the UHD 730 score almost 10 FPS higher than the previous gen chip, but it remained pretty stable in the process. I'm sure a lot of people will find 36 FPS playable, though you could always drop resolution further if you prefer smoother gameplay. Finally, ending with a bang. Since I removed Rocket League from my regular test suite, I haven't gone back to it so much, so my skills are rusty as hell, but I still managed a slightly jammy hat trick. At 1080 with high performance settings, the UHD 730 managed to keep things above 60 FPS for the most part, and felt like an eminently playable experience. To the question in the title of this video then, yes, the UHD 730 can game, within reason, and only if you keep your expectations in check. It's probably better than its Nvidia namesake, the GT730, and undoubtedly better than pretty much any incarnation of the GT710 or AMD R5 240. So, if your seller on Amazon or eBay is including one of these discrete GPUs and claiming it makes it a gaming PC, I'm here to call bullshit on that. You could pull that card out, use the UHD 730 integrated graphics and see better frame rates in virtually every title, plus it's DirectX 12 compatible. That's not to say you shouldn't aim for something better for your money, you could consider getting the cheaper F version of the CPU and use the money you save to put towards something more powerful. I have a couple of suggestions linked on screen now, and next week I'll be looking at what is possibly the best sub $50 graphics card that can run basically everything. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.